you. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. You ready? Sure. All right. Let's do this. <laughs> um, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Danielle Atkinson. Um, I have many titles, but for the purpose of this conversation, I am a, a mom of six, and I live in Royal Oak, Michigan, and I'm a paid leave advocate. Um, so I am so happy to be joined with this group of really strong Michigan women to have a conversation that's really important. And at this time, we know that uh, Donald Trump will be going to Saginaw County, spreading lies and attacking our freedoms. And we're here to talk about the issues that women are really facing in Michigan. Um, and it goes without saying that we also are sending a very clear, concise message to Donald Trump to back off our reproductive freedoms. Um, it was just this week that Trump doubled down on his attacks on women and said that, you know, very complacently, that it's okay to monitor women's cycles and that um, he doesn't really have a position and to leave it up to the state on abortion rights. And we know that's not what a leader says, especially in a moment as critical as this. And we are happy to be joined by Governor Whitmer, who has fought like hell to protect our reproductive freedoms. Uh, we are so grateful for doing that for us and for our children. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to the governor for remarks. Okay, I'll make a few opening remarks, but I think the point of this is to make sure that it's women's voices that are being heard. And so while I too am a woman and I've used my voice frequently, I wanna make sure that we spend our time talking about what the threats to reproductive health continue to look like here in Michigan and across the country and what it would mean for women's lives and our families. And so I appreciate you being here. You shouldn't have to always have these hard conversations just to hold on to a fundamental right that we've had and for 50 years in this country. But right now we know it's more important than ever that we yeah. do. We're seeing a six week ban go into place in, in Florida today. We're seeing a presidential candidate who has said he would, you know, he's leaving the door open to signing a national abortion ban. And I think for Michiganders um, to believe we made such great strides in the last, you know, 18 months, yet this is still very much a precarious moment that our rights could be rolled back. Not just the right to access abortion when we need it, but the right to access contraception, the right to create a family through IVF or, or um, you know, other means. And so I think that's why this is so crucial that we keep having these hard conversations. And um, as, as governor, I'm proud of the great strides we've made in Michigan. I am one of many who was a part of that effort. All of you were as well. Um, but I'm sober about how, how precarious this truly mm -hmm. is and what women are going through in other states could very well become our reality too. And that's why this is, conversation is so important. So. I'll stop talking and do a lot of listening, but I appreciate you you being here and the work that you do every day to protect these rights for the people in our state and, and my daughters in particular. Yeah. Appreciate you. And so we know this is Gretchen. I don't want to go around and have everyone just introduce yourself, your name, and who you're with. Um, my name is Jessica Romanowski. I'm a mother as well, and also I'm a veteran. Um, I'm Dr. Asia Harris. I'm a family medicine doctor in Flint, Michigan. My name is Stephanie Jones, and I am a mother um, through IVF and also um, an advocate for fertility rights. Um, I'm Harshita, I'm currently getting my master's in public health and starting medical school this summer, and I am part of, well, we're both a part of an organization called East Lansing Free Emergency Contraception, where we hand out free Plan B to students on campus. And I am Julia Walters, and I am a law student at Michigan State University. Right. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Um, so, you know, the overturning of Roe versus Wade is a moment in history, recent history that I think we'll never forget. And so I really would love for you guys to tell us about how that impacted your life, your advocacy, and the people that rely on you and depend on you. Um, for me, it, um, I was angry. Yeah. So, um, but I it got me motivated. It got me active. Mm -hmm. And it was that moment in time where it was like, it's on us to really get out there and fight like hell um, because we have to. Nobody else is going to save us. I'll say as a primary care doctor, when um, that was overturned, it was painful. Yeah. Um, a lot of my patients, a lot of my family and friends 
um, we're realizing the impact on women's rights um, just by that one decision and how health access is going to change. And a lot of things that have happened um, over the decades have made health and medicine safer. Um, and so the things that are happening um, regarding women's rights is challenging for health professionals to um, provide quality, evidence-based, and safe care. Um, for me, you know, I, I felt invisible. I felt less than. I've had uh, two abortions myself, and um, if, if they weren't those abortions, I wouldn't be here today to advocate for the rights that we're all fighting for. Um, I felt misunderstood, and I felt really scared, scared for other people that would find themselves in the position that I was in, scared for my family, um, scared for my children. Um, they, you never know when infertility or um, the need for uh, you know, abortion will be part of your story. And to have that taken away, it is, it's terrifying, so. Yeah, I was actually in DC. That was my first day interning when Roe v. Wade got overturned. So I remember like being furious in front of um, the Supreme Court and like protesting. It was, I was so angry because I was like, at that time, I think I was 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. And it was just frustrating that this policy somehow impacted me and I, I don't know what my future is going to entail. Well, I need to get IVF. Well, I need to get an abortion. And I think that's when I really was, and that really made me want to go into women's health and become an OBGYN because I realized I want to be able to protect patients and protect myself as well and be able to advocate for the need to have better women's health and to protect abortion. Um, echoing a lot of the feelings that I heard and emotions, uh, angry, uh, very you know scared um but i also there was a, a little like glimmer of hope i had the opportunity actually that day of the uh leak and then also around the uh, decision as well to gather with a bunch of um, amazing michigan women and allies at the capitol and we just kind of all stood there in solidarity and it felt like that was a really resounding message to continue to like build this coalition to fight back um i guess these uh, egregious decisions and uh, acts and beliefs yeah and so Keeping in mind that we passed Prop 4 and that we have the right in our Constitution, um, when we're talking to our friends and family about this, what are we, how do we make sure that folks understand that a Trump presidency um, and how that will be different than a Biden presidency? What does it mean? And so how do we communicate that uh, to our friends and family? And how do you do it right now is really the question. I'll start here and then we'll... <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, um, I think that you can kind of, you know, look at the rhetoric that's coming out of um, the presumptive Republican nominee's, you know, mouth essentially, and like all of the people that are in his uh, space to see what would happen if he was were to become president. Um, and it's, you know, not you know just if he becomes president. There's a Republican Congress. I mean, we have the Comstock Act, which is lying dormant, which could, you know, completely. Um, upheave everything, you know, and all the progress that we've made. And so that is a very real fear. And I think the way that I um, communicate that as a student is just trying to, like, get in touch with people in my community and, you know, speak, you know, about these dangers, but also just maybe providing, like, more education resources. I think students are a population where sometimes, you know, they're maybe isolated from family. And so they, you know, may need, like, that extra support, especially when it comes to things like reproductive health care echoing that as well. Um, I think it's another thing that it doesn't end at just IVF or abortion. It could end to emergency contraception. It could end to birth control. And as like a young woman, that is something that we want to have access and accessibility to. And so for me, it's constantly talking to my peers who, I mean, we're pre-med. We don't talk about politics, but recognizing that your job and the line of work that you want to do can be affected by politics. So it's mm -hmm. echoing that even though you may not want are interested in politics, recognizing the need to vote, to tell young people you need to go vote, it makes a huge impact on your future access to care and currently as well. And on your doctor's ability yes. to do your job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Right? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. It is that's so true. Um, I I take an education approach. I live in the Genesee County area. I live in a more rural community that tends to be a bit more conservative and, and really I feel my job is to educate and to use my life example and story and my family story as one to show, to kind of debunk the stereotypes that people think. They think that this is what it looks like or it's 
you know, women who are uneducated or don't understand and so on and so forth. And, and, I, and I do my best to show why protection of these freedoms and these rights are so necessary because people will lose their lives. I mean, no matter how you slice it, dice it, it doesn't matter. It, it comes down to health care. These are health care decisions. And it's the full spectrum. And that's the thing is I use the yeah. opportunity to say, it's the it's not just when not to have a child it's when you want to have yeah. a child and yeah. when you want to have a child there are many things that are important access to contraception you know people don't realize that contraception is part of IVF cycles yeah they don't understand that um, you know they don't even understand sometimes the need for IVF IVF is part of surrogacy without IVF you don't have surrogacy without IVF you don't have tens and hundreds of thousands that are being chil born children that are being born in our country but also understanding that an embryo doesn't equal a child right I've been doing a lot of that narrative discussion right now I, you know and that's important so it's really the education piece and and bringing people that otherwise might not understand or agree to the side of this is the reality people are living in mm -hmm. this isn't rhetoric this isn't political talk this is our lives yeah and I think that's so important because we live such a holistic life right so you have had an abortion and you're an advocate for IVF I've had um, miscarriages like all of this is a larger abortion and reproductive rights conversation um, dr. Harris I really wanted you to talk more about the conversations that you have with your patients as you are like the front line uh, you know person that they go to first around any issue that they're having yeah no I I have a lot of women that I take care of, um, from teens to adults to older women. So everyone's reproductive kind of journey um, is different based yeah. on their education, their understanding, their environment. Uh, but one of the things that continues to come up is people are uncertain about what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to healthcare, no matter what the medical problem is, people don't like being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we live in a very, com like the United States is very comfortable as far mm -hmm. as the, the country. and. Um, people are unable to remember or be aware of what was in place before yeah. um, these uh, progress and, and these rights were kind of made. And so when I talk to people um, in the real time, they feel like they have access because Michigan has done a great job mm -hmm. with um, providing reproductive access. Um, but we're watching all these other states um, deal with um, these barriers, these new laws, these policies. Um, and they're very creative and innovative in how they do it, but people don't understand that can trickle into um, their everyday life. Um, it might not be you who needs to access that care. It might be your friend, it might be your daughter, it might be your sister. And we don't, as a community, talk enough about reproductive health and just the process in, in, in itself. Um, but my, my patients are concerned. They're scared. Um, they really just don't know what I'll be able to do for them. Um, yeah. There are things that I provide to my patients right now that maybe I won't in 10, 15 years, or maybe a couple years, like who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that uncertainty makes them feel like we're, we're gonna revert back to a time that is not ideal for women. Mm -hmm. um, and that will have a chain reaction in how women um, get jobs, how we pursue education, how we grow our families, how we um, pick our partners, whatever it may be, um, it's gonna have a huge chain reaction and that is um, creating a lot of anxiety for Please. Oh, did you have something? To I, say? I, well, I was just going to say, you know, I was listening to the reports out of Florida and just how incredibly cruel um, and ill informed these policies are. And I was thinking about, you know, I shared that I um, was sexually assaulted when I was in college. And um, for a rape, you know, a rape victim to go through that is heavy enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then the realization that maybe you were impregnated with your attackers you know maybe you're carrying an embryo that from your attacker and and the thought that okay I can make my own decision about what's necessary was one of the few things that was comforting in that time and women in Florida now are, who are victims of rape have to show documentation mm -hmm. yeah have Across to show the proof place, right and I just thought how incredibly cruel an impossible of a thing that you're asking women simply who I mean it's just it, it just like I'm still processing right. that about how horrible that is about the possibility of tracking women's menstrual cycles mm -hmm. yeah. I think any any policy that requires proof of, of reason mm -hmm. um, is problematic mm -hmm. in the sense that um, you know if, if 
I had to provide proof that I needed an abortion when I was at that point, I wouldn't have survived. Right. Our physicians need un the unencumbered right and the un to make unencumbered decisions about the care of their patients. No one else should be involved in that. We shouldn't be yeah. having to be put through additional suffering and cruel, and even just putting your life. Because there's also the mental aspect of, mm -hmm. the mental health aspect of what you went through and other people that people have to deal with. And also the acknowledgement. How, how do we do we want people knowing our personal business? I mean, it, it, it's it's really invasive, and we should be very careful about those well, things. Well, that's where the right to privacy with Roe yes. is, and that's HIPAA. That, that protection is there, and not having that, you lose that ability to have that right to privacy, and that's why Roe is so important. I'll yeah. add to, so one of my concerns as a doctor is the fact that when people don't have really good access, people get desperate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When people get desperate, they do unsafe things, yeah. and so, um, all the healthcare that we know right now around abortion is the safest evidence-based way to do it. Um, and years and years ago, they used to do back alley abortions, mm -hmm. and that was unsafe for um, the mother, unsafe for all the uh, the people involved, and it had a lot of complications. Yeah. Um, and we don't want that. We already have enough maternal mortality and morbidity rates um, that are too high. Um, but yeah. things like this that are uh, threatening people's access, people will do stuff still. Yeah, right, right. It might not be like in the sunshine and you know in the open, but people are still gonna right. get it done and it's not gonna be pretty. Right. Yeah. And I mean, then they'll be criminalized. Exactly. And so the states that want to. Yeah. When Roe e. Wade got overturned, I remember on like Instagram and TikTok, people were like, delete your period yeah. apps. Yeah. Like, oh, here's like, like people would say like, if you take this much vitamin C, like you can like, it was like there was like also false information being spread too, which is kind of scary in that aspect. I believe so. the Texas Attorney General was tracking. Yeah. Um, periods. It's it, the conversation that we're having right this second just makes me think about how a law and laws can get in the way of how we care for each other. Mm -hmm. You know how we advise our children. Like you know, I was telling my teenage girls, delete the apps. Yeah. Um, you know, when people are asking where I should go, what should I do, you know, these are all questions that we never had before mm -hmm. that are putting our, our bodies, our, our personal autonomy and safety in jeopardy. And I really wanted to talk to you yeah. about the fact that you're a veteran, yes. you know? And when we have states that are, one state it's legal, one state it's not, and you are part of a military family, mm -hmm. what does that mean? You could be, you know, you could go somewhere and it's, yeah. I, I often think of the women that are serving and the spouses of husbands. Like, they have more rights on a federal installation than yeah. when they walk off base. And that, for me, is as, as somebody who took the oath uh, to serve our country and fight for rights, that is the biggest, um, it's disappointing. It's, yeah. it's sad that we have more rights when we are serving our country on base and then we walk off base and God forbid um, somebody who's serving is pregnant and they have an emergency and they are too far away from an installation and they need care, say in Texas, they could die in that parking lot without, because they're not gonna be transported if they're too mm -hmm. far, because mm -hmm. they're not stabilized. And right now we're dealing with Mtala in the Supreme Court and we don't know how that's gonna go because they're discussing how many organs we can lose before, mm -hmm. yes. you know, it's, there's so many, the dominoes that they just keep talking about. It's like Roe was the first one, the first domino of so many. and. I think about so many other women who are struggling as veterans. Like, what did we fight for? Yeah. If, if, if right. this is, if I don't have, can't govern over my own body, what did I really do? Like, right. and, yeah. and when I talk to people, going back to that question you were asking, I, I bring up my veteran status because a lot of people have this idea that we, a lot of us are, you know, right leaning or, you know, I, I try to focus on the fact that we believe in human rights, because abortion access is a human right. Reproductive freedom is a human right. And I've had abortions. And putting a face to somebody who's a veteran, yeah. who has had an abortion, is important. And my husband served, both my parents have served. I come from a long line of it. And it, it's just not okay. Um, and, and a lot of times, it's the education part. Mm -hmm. It's helping people understand that this whole reproductive conversation is about 0.01% of people who actually go out there and just want to have an abortion because they don't want to kid. We're dealing mostly with miscarriages, if I'm not mistaken. Ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic yeah. Pregnancy. yeah, like we're not dealing with somebody who just doesn't want to have a kid. We're dealing with women who, one in four women who have miscarriages. And, yeah. and the fact that we're have, ha, continuing to have these conversations because of the 
like somebody's political position or religion yeah. it's it's I think, you know, more importantly, like we're having this conversation about our ability to decide for ourselves what our life will yeah. look like mm -hmm. and, and what our life will look like for the people that care for us and the people who we care for. Absolutely. And, you know, you brought into this conversation life of a mother, right? That yes. conversation that we're having right now of what that means. And I would love to turn to our, our lawyer, <laughs> our, our next lawyer, our yes. next doctor to talk exactly what that means in, in real life scenario when we're having a conversation about the life of a mother what does that mean for a woman walking around i think i think for me and i think julia can also attest to this is the idea by this is as i'm applying to medical school it's yeah. a hard to get into <laughs> a school so i applied widely and when it came down to choosing it literally i ended up choosing msu but it came down to i can't go to a state in alabama because i don't know as an I want to go into OBGYN. I'm not going to get the best education mm -hmm. in Alabama than I will in Michigan. Like, people, students are genuinely choosing where they want to go to school because of these laws, because of these protections. And it shouldn't be. Like, I should have the freedom of wanting to get my education elsewhere, too. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And so it's scary on that aspect. And I think, too, like, I don't plan on having kids till I'm 33. I don't think <laughs> I'm going, I, I need to finish schooling. I need to finish schooling. Like, I have a long way to go. And But the idea that in the future I might need these services is like, and it, I don't know what it's gonna be like in the future. Like, I don't know what type of protections I'll have. Could I even get birth control next year? Like, mm -hmm. it's scary. And not everyone takes birth control to prevent pregnancy right. they take mm -hmm. it like i have really bad menstrual symptoms i get migraines i get really bad abdominal pain so being able to control my hormones so i can still be a student is so needed because menstrual policies are also not the best right. so we need to work on that as well like there's not just that aspect right. of reproductive care there's so, it's so wide and so large and so coming as like a younger woman in this aspect for me it's just like I'd so sad that I had to have this conversation yeah. and be fighting for something I might need in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, for, for me, looking at when I was applying to law school last year, um, I was actually applying to school, law school at the same time my little sister was applying to college. Mm -hmm. And both for both of us, there were states that were automatically off of our list mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we didn't want to be in a place that, you know, if, if something happened. And also mm -hmm. just didn't want to be in a state where there wasn't support, where you know states that felt that you know women and pregnant capable people could not make decisions um, for themselves, I didn't want to go uh, get further my education in a state like that, um, and so that was just you know not the the environment for me, and that's ultimately why you know I ended up you know deciding to stay um, in Michigan to pursue my education, and I know that that's been a factor for many. Um, like peer conversations I've had with like other um, students and people and also for folks who are starting out their careers mm -hmm. um, it's because you know you could cross state lines and automatically something you do can be criminalized and yeah. you could go to jail and that's not just for abortion that could be for miscarriage care or any number of things with mm -hmm. these like this legislation that we continue to see popping up and also decisions that are coming down from radical courts yeah, yeah. so um in the spirit of our future lawyer, I think we're gonna go into closing arguments, right? <laughs> so I'd love for us to go around the table and then our governor will, will close us out. Um, just what is your message to people who are looking at this issue, they're looking at a variety of issues and they're weighing their options for who they're gonna vote for for president? What, what would you say to them? I think that you have to look at who is for the people mm -hmm. and who is not. Um, we have somebody who is a clear th threat to our democracy and a clear th threat to human rights. Um, and Biden is for, Biden and um, Kamala Harris is for us, women, but also for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, their focus on like all of our rights. And really, I, I see a lot of talk about not just reproductive care, but so many other things. And Trump is a clear threat to our democracy in many different ways, not just abortion access. He, as a veteran, it is terrifying to see um, the things that people just excuse. Um, but just when it comes to reproductive rights, it's definitely um, Biden. Yeah, thank you. I'll say um, when people walk into a medical office or walk into a clinic, um, the ability to walk into that space is yeah. really important. And so protecting just that journey um, is ideal, but not only protecting you getting into a medical office or a hospital, um, but also you being able to 
trust that your doctor is able to provide the best and most evidence-based care. So that way you have better health outcomes, that way you have better quality care. Yeah. Um, tying the doctor's hands behind their back when they want to provide something um, is not gonna be safe for people. Um, and having um, Biden and uh, Harris supporting and advocating for our rights to choose our rights to make decisions about how we want to access care and the opportunity to access care is so important for the longevity of our own lives but also our legacy that we're trying to leave behind. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, you know, I think it comes down to something that our governor says frequently is watch what they do, not what they say. Mm -hmm. And I it really, you know, when our former president appointed radicalized justices to our Supreme Court, which carried out his wishes to overturn Roe v. Wade, you know, what started as an erosion has turned into a landslide. Yeah. So what started as what a lot of people thought was Roe v. Wade, we knew it wasn't ending there. And it's not going to continue to end there if we elect Trump into office. We have to elect leaders into our all areas of our government, especially our federal government, who are going to respect us. I think that's the number one thing, be respected listen to us, majority of Americans do not support what is going on. That is statistically proven. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we are aware of that and we are very serious when we cast our votes that we understand the implications of those votes. I mean, nowadays, it's not about being fiscally conservative or not or whatever it is. We're talking about human rights are at stake. And I certainly know that um, just from my perspective as an advocate and just a person, that nobody has a crystal ball. You know, no one knows at any point in their life when they will need this care. And majority of women will, we know that, regardless of what spectrum we're talking about here, from birth control to abortion to care, to infertility care, so on and so forth. So I think what we're seeing from the right is this idea that it's just this predictable outcome and, and it's everything fits into this box. And that is very rarely the occasion, or you know, what happens. So realistically, it's about being real and supporting and electing leaders who are going to continue to protect us and continue to hear us and do what is right for everyone and take a human rights approach to policy as well as um, you know their what they're continuing to fight for. Oh, I feel like you just said that also. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like for me especially is telling like the younger voters out there, the young folks to go out and vote. It is so crucial to have your voice said because like you're all saying, this is such a fundamental human rights. You don't know what you're gonna need in four years from now, and four years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Like, knowing that anything could happen for my access to birth control, emergency contraception, for my access to abortion could be eliminated. I wanna make sure, and I think a lot of young people wanna make sure that the next person has the same accessibility and access like I do, and as, as well as affordability. And so being able to ensure that you're voting for the right people, definitely not Trump in this situation, you wanna be voting the right people that are gonna be protecting that healthcare and be protecting your rights because four years is a long way. So it's making sure that you go out and vote on that day and to echo your voice. Um, ab absolutely, to everything any, everyone has said thus far. Um, I would also mostly just, you know, getting healthcare out of the courtrooms and, you know, yeah. putting it back into the hands of, uh, you know, clinicians and physicians and other providers um, and, and families to make decisions um, and just, you know, continuing to keep that access uh, to healthcare. And healthcare is a fundamental human right and we, we know what another Trump presidency would do not only to reproductive healthcare, but just healthcare in general. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the president and the vice president um, have a clear record on showing that they're going to continue to build on access so that you know more Americans can have access to healthcare and make the decision for them and their families. Another yeah. great round table. First of all, thank you all for being here. I know everyone here wears a lot of different hats and you've got a lot of pressures on your time, so I appreciate you lending your perspective and your voice to this conversation. And I would just close out by saying, you know, the roundtables that we did going into the election of 2022 when we were able to codify abortion rights by enshrining in our constitution, I had learned so much from, from women and, and people across Michigan who showed up for the conversation. Sitting across the table from a lot of women who were Republicans, who still are Republicans, who said, I've never voted for a Democrat, but I'm knocking doors for 
this initiative for you and for everyone who's fighting for my rights and the rights of my, my children and future generations. And we need all of this coalition to still be very activated. Um, I want to invite those Republican women and independents who supported a woman's right to choose back into this moment because the work is not yet done. Mm -hmm. This is all still continues to be very precarious. And the mess that we're seeing women in other states confronting immediately with the change in their rights, the fears for their safety and health, the clinicians' ability to do their jobs could very well be back here in Michigan if we don't reelect President Biden and Vice President Harris. And so any short, any vote short of an affirmative vote for the Harris-Biden agenda puts all of this back into jeopardy. And that's why we all still have to be a part of this and lending our voices. So I thank you for the work that you're doing. And I'm honored to be at the table with all of you. And um, you did a wonderful job once thank again. You. So thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I just want to thank our panelists again. Um, it is enough that you are here just for yourself and your own right, but rights, but we know that you're here for so many other people that follow you, that depend on you, uh, that look to you for your wisdom. And so for that, I am so grateful to be here with you. Uh, it's a shame that we have to have a conversation about a private matter that is about our personal bodily autonomy and, and, and what we want to do in this world, but we are having that conversation. And we will continue to have that conversation and speak loudly about the contrast that we have in choices this November. Um, so thank you all so much. And, and with that, our round table is over. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Oh, thanks. Right. Thank you. I think we're doing a picture, picture here. Yeah. Okay. Listen.